Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you for all of you uh, sticking around for the last two presentations of the day. Hopefully you'll find it worthwhile. I'm going to be speaking uh, with a focus on the USDA Rootstock Development Program. I know Jude's uh, following on me and talking about the IFAS program. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, New USDA Rootstocks for Better Disease Tolerance and Fruit Productivity. I'm going to start off talking about four rootstocks that were released by the USDA in the last 12 years, um, kind of giving a little more detail and performance information as to how they are doing uh, at present in productivity, and then uh, some words about new rootstocks currently under development that aren't yet really commercially available. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Florida industry support uh, through CRDF grants and also the Florida Citrus Research Foundation that provides the Whitmore Foundation Farm for USDA research. I'd also like to acknowledge the involvement of uh, a number of other scientists, Dr. Greg McCollum, Jim Graham, and Bob Adair, as well as uh, support staff of technicians and support scientists that work with me at the USDA. Well. Citrus, I think, clearly uh, has a lot of problems in Florida. Some of those traits to problems with the rootstocks uh, in particular. Uh, sometimes young trees decline. Uh, in other cases, older trees such as these uh, can get blown over in hurricanes. At present, there are some specific problems that uh, concern most people, I guess, related to HLB. But there are a lot of other potential threats to citrus, specifically affecting the rootstock that we can't ignore when we're talking about rootstock performance. New Florida rootstocks need uh, to have a favorable effect on things like fruit yield, tree size, uh, fruit sweetness. Um, fruit yield probably is priority number one as far as I'm concerned. Even with HLB, really, the thing that could, should concern you most is how much fruit you're producing on those trees. It doesn't do you any good if the trees grow well but don't produce fruit. In addition, uh, the rootstocks need to induce tolerance to a number of different Path, uh, pathogens and uh, environmental stresses, uh, with greening HLB probably being the most important, but certainly tolerance to Phytophthora, Tristeza, Diprepes, Blight, and a number of other problems is still very important. The objectives of the USDA breeding program are several fold. First, to create new candidate rootstocks, uh, to screen those candidate rootstocks, and to test them into field trials and finally to release them for commercial use uh, with the test, the field testing and the release for commercial use being the most important. I'm, again, I'm going to uh, go on and talk about uh, new USDA rootstocks that have been released. Uh, those are four released in the last 12 years. I'm also going to re um, comment about the Super Sour Development Program, which is underway now, and development of HLV-resistant rootstocks, uh, in particular uh, focusing on genetic transformation. The new USDA rootstocks that were released in the last 12 years are first US812 released in 2001, US802 and US897 both released in 2007, and US942 released in 2010. Um, US812 is a highly productive rootstock, uh, induces good fruit quality on scions, uh, has good soil adaptability and disease resistance, and produces a standard or medium-sized tree. Uh, somewhat comparable to a tree on Carrizo or Swingle rootstock. US 802 and US 897 both are highly productive per tree size, good soil adaptability and disease, resi disease resistance. Those two rootstocks in particular were identified and selected because of uh, a rather high tolerance to diapreppes and phytophthora in areas that have a severe diapreppes problem. There is a very large contrast in vigor and tree size on those two rootstocks with US802 inducing a very large tree, US897 inducing a small tree size. And I'll say a little more, more about that in a few minutes. US942 uh, was the most recently released rootstock, uh, very highly productive, uh, also induces good fruit quality, good soil adaptability and disease resistance, and makes a medium small tree. Well, now I'm going to comment about field testing, and you'll see in these field trials, in some cases, there are several of these root different rootstocks, as I've mentioned, uh, along with standard rootstocks for comparison. Unfortunately, most of the trials don't include all the different rootstocks and all the standards in the same trial, so there's some interpolation we need to do in inferring how different rootstocks are going to do in different environments and compared with other rootstocks. Uh, the first trial I'm going to mention is one a cooperative trial with Bentley Brothers. Uh, this was at Lynchburg in Polk County. 
Actually, the trial was planned in 1991, and the data from this trial are all uh, that I'm presenting today is all pre-HLB. So you'll have to uh, uh, take this uh, with a bit of skepticism for present day. The trial looked like this from the air. Uh, you can see the block included about 500 trees, four trees, uh, six sets of four trees for each rootstock. The performance over uh, the first um, four years of the trial are presented here. You can see US 812 uh, at the top of the list and the final column pound soluble solids per acre per year. Uh, that was the productivity that the, uh, that particular rootstock did in the trial. US 942 was second on the list at 4,200 pound soluble solids per acre per year. You can see Swingle and uh, Carrizo both performed rather well in the trial, but considerably behind uh, US 812 and US 942, something close to 1,000 pound soluble solids per acre per year lower productivity. <clears throat> The second trial I'll mention is USDA trial, a cooperative trial with Ori Lee in Osceola County. This is with Hamlin Scion. Uh, the yield is shown in the second column, rootstock in the first column, yield in the second column. Uh, tree height at 18 years old uh, in that uh, third column. You can see Swingle uh, produced, and this is a productivity over uh, per, per tree, bought in boxes of per tree over the five year period, six year period that's documented there. You can see 33 boxes of fruit per tree over that six year period with a tree height of just under 16 feet tall. US 802 was the most productive in the trial at 44 boxes of per fruit per tree, uh, but a considerably taller tree, about 20 feet tall. US 897, US 897 was very, uh, rather lower productivity, 24 boxes of fruit per tree, but a much smaller tree at nine feet tall. And again, if you remember when I talked about the release of US 802 and US 897, they were contrasted in terms of tree size, with US 802 and US 897 making very big differences in tree size. To, to show you what it looked like in that particular trial, this is a US 802 tree, um, a Hamlin on US 802 taken about uh, 15 years old. You can see made a rather large tree, US 897, same trial, same scion. Um, same age tree made a much smaller tree. So big contrast in tree vigor induced by the rootstock. <clears throat> Another trial I'm gonna mention is at Conserve. This is also with Hamlin Scion. Um, the final column shows productivity over a uh, five year period. Um, you can see Carrizo and Swingle productivity. Again, this is in pounds of fruit per tree at 711 and 543 pounds of fruit per tree for those two rootstocks. US 942 and US 812 were significantly more productive, or at least US 942 was, as compared with Carrizo and Swingle in that trial. And uh, US 812 also performed reasonably well. <clears throat> the next trial I'm gonna mention is a cooperative trial with uh, George Walker. Uh, this was at uh, Corkscrew Planning in Collier County, uh, Valencia Scion. This is what the trial looked like. Uh, I believe this was about eight years old. Um, the data sh shown here is a summary over a five-year period, <clears throat> again sorted by productivity per rootstock. In this trial, US 812 was the most productive over that period in the trial. The trial was affected in uh, 2009 and 2010 somewhat by greening disease. You can see US 812 again uh, over the five-year period, 842 pounds of fruit per tree. In comparison, uh, Carrizo in that same trial was about 700 pounds of fruit per tree. Uh, US 802 and US 897 a bit behind. Interestingly enough, despite the big difference in uh, tree size for those two rootstocks, the productivity was similar in this particular trial. And you can see Swingle and Clio were at the bottom of the list in this particular trial at around 500 pounds of fruit per tree. The next trial I'm gonna mention is a cooperative trial uh, with Collier Groves. This is a silver strand uh, planting in Collier County. Again, with Valencia Scion. Uh, this is a photograph um, during the harvest of the trial. Um, actually, uh, I think it was last week. Unfortunately, I don't have the summary of the data from last week's uh, harvest in this table, but this gives you the uh, data from two different years, 2010 and 2012. Again, in the final, the third column, fourth column, um, total pounds of fruit per tree over that two year period. You can see US 802 was most productive. Uh, of the rootstocks in that trial. US 942 was second on the list. 
Um, the other, including most of the standards, kind of coming out a, a bit behind in productivity uh, between 220 and 260 pounds of fruit per tree. And you can see in this particular case, US 897 was at the bottom of the list in productivity, although remember this is a tree that, a rootstock that makes a much smaller tree, so you have to factor in, take into account the size of the tree and the fact that you might plant it at a higher density. <clears throat> the next trial I'm gonna mention is a cooperative trial with David Wheeler in uh, Polk County. Uh, Valencia trees planted in 2008. Uh, you can see roughly location by uh, Bach Tower in the background. Uh, you can see this photograph again was taken a couple weeks ago when we were there for the harvest. Many of the trees tr in the trial still look good. Others look very bad. The trees are um, uh, in many cases infected by HLB. But, uh, in terms of productivity over the last two years, uh, you can see the rootstocks are sorted in this table. US 942 and US 896 uh, being the total, the uh, most highly productive rootstocks in the trial over the two year period. Uh, making 220 to 240 pounds of fruit per tree. Uh, US 802 and US 812 were third and fourth on the list. Uh, and some of the commercial standards, Koharski, Swingle, Carrizo, uh, combined with US 897, a bit behind. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Kinkoji and Cleopatra were at the bottom of the list in productivity uh, during these first two harvests from the trial. Well, I'm not gonna take the time to talk at great uh, length today about uh, rootstock effect on fruit quality because that's a whole nother complicating factor, but I will summarize uh, a bit about that because certainly rootstocks do have a big effect on fruit quality. Uh, as an example, this is uh, data from a grapefruit trial uh, with Tom Hammond in Indian River County, planted in 2005, 2006. You can see if you look uh, through the columns, the first column gives rootstock, second spacing uh, down the row in the trial, number of trees in the trial and percent of trees dead. Uh, you can see this is a rather large trial having between 456 and 672 trees per rootstock in the trial. So it's a very large trial. You can see sour orange again at a uh, little over 10% of the trees dead during the first uh, five years. We did have substantial tree mortality. This is not really from defined cause, so I can't say for sure why. Um, the least number of damaged trees, uh, dead trees, were with US 812 and US 897 in the trial. <clears throat> well, we looked at a number of different fruit quality parameters in the trial. You can see this just gives early harvest uh, information about solids acid ratio. I don't know if you can see the colors of the um, of the graph, again, this is September through October harvest times. You can see X639 was the lowest, lowest solid acid ratio during this harvest period, and I think that tracked true throughout the, uh, the whole harvest season. Sour orange and US852 uh, were the highest solid acid ratio throughout that time period. I'm gonna mention a little more about some other fruit quality parameters, not BRICS acid ratio that were collected from this, uh, from this trial. Uh, the first column here is fruit weight. Uh, second is sheep nosing, where the higher number means there was more sheep nosing on the fruit. And the third is peel thickness, again, a characteristic that's of some importance with grapefruit. Uh, interestingly enough, sour orange, or maybe not, not surprisingly, sour orange on the average made the largest fruit. I guess maybe somewhat surprisingly, it also had the most sheep nosing and the thickest uh, rind peel. US 897, in contrast, had the smallest uh, fruit, the least sheep nosing, and the thinnest peel. Uh, perhaps uh, the sheep nosing and peel thickness, one thing we might infer by this a bit is that it is greatly influenced by fruit size. So when you're making bigger fruit in general, you're gonna get much more sheep nosing and thicker peel. Uh, and US 812 came out pretty much in the middle in terms of influence on all those traits. Another trial I'm gonna pick out to just mention something about fruit quality is a Mineolus a trial with Mineolus ion. This is at the USDA Picos farm in Fort Pierce. Uh, you can see the yield data uh, just from the, uh, a few months ago on these particular trees, uh, which are 100% infected by HLB. You can see US 942 was the most productive rootstock in the trial, although at 61 pounds of fruit per tree, you're still nothing to get too much excited about. Um, the other rootstocks were all some, uh, significantly less productive, including US 897, 802, Swingle, 812, Sour Orange, and Carrizo, with uh, Q 
King Koji and Cleopatra being the least productive. <clears throat> but again, I'm focusing more on the effect on fruit quality at the moment. And you can see US 942, US 897, and US 812 induced the highest bricks in these uh, miniola fruit at, at harvest time. Uh, you, the rootstock US 802, sour orange, Kinkosi, and Cleopatra were the lowest bricks effect on the, the uh, fruit at harvest time. Well, the commercial use of the new USDA rootstocks is t to some extent increasing. Uh, Swingles, and this is a Budward report uh, that finished uh, last summer. You can see Swingle was th still at 37% of new propagations within the industry. The total of those four rootstocks together that I mentioned is about 9%, although it does seem to continue to be on the increase and is mainly limited by the seed availability for nursery propagations. Well, the other thing I promised to mention something about is the uh, current effort on developing, continuing to develop new rootstocks. One part of that is what I call a super sour project, developing a sour orange type rootstock that is improved. Um, and the idea is to basically, um, instead of just having a sour orange, is to develop a sour orange that has CTV resistance and HLB resistance to give us what we call a super sour. <clears throat> well. Tristasia resistance, while is certainly not of as much prominence in the industry right now as resistance to HLB, certainly is still important to have a rootstock that's going to tolerate H Tristasia. Uh, and I think we can see that in, some, in many uh, field plantings, uh, field trials and field plantings where trees on tr sour are, are severely stunted or performing poorly. This is one particular trial actually that was uh, conducted in Polk County several years ago. You can see uh, this particular tree inside the red circle is an eight-year-old tree of Valencia on sour orange, uh, obviously severely inf uh, infected by Tristasia at a young age and severely stunted. The tree on the right in the trial is the same age, also Valencia on US 812 rootstock. Clearly sour orange is severely affected by Tristasia, US 812 is not. Well, at present within the super sour project and, and also for d other development of rootstocks, uh, we're using r shorter term tests for tristasia resistance in the greenhouse to try to assess whether trees are, whether rootstocks are tolerant to tristasia, and then following that up with field trials to confirm the resistance. <clears throat> you can see what happens with standard sour in this particular uh, graph. Uh, this shows a valen uh, two trees, well actually it was a, an experiment where we had several trees of each uh, Valencia on sour, uh, some of which we did not infect with Tristasia, the green bar, some of which were infected with Tristasia, the red bar. And uh, the graph is basically showing the amount of growth on the tree following uh, the inoculation or not inoculation. You can see trees that were not infected with Tristasia grew a lot more than trees were infected with Tristasia. So this is just a way of measuring the response to Tristasia infection. <coughs> In the studies that we do, what we're doing is basically wanting to test the super sour selections, and you can show, see this shows the result from one particular super sour that even when it's infected with Tristasia, there's no growth, no stunning effect. The tree, the red bar is uh, basically showing the trees shown by the red bar are growing just as much as the uninfected trees. Uh, another disease pest problem that we're concerned about is Phytophthora and Diaprepes weevil. Um, we can show with greenhouse testing uh, rootstock ability to tolerate Phytophthora disease, and there are several different Phytophthora uh, pathogens that we're concerned about. This is showing uh, growth reduction, uh, reduction in, in root mass following inoculation. You can see at the bottom, pineapple, carrizo, and swingle show something like 50 to 60 percent uh, root reduction um, following infection. Uh, the rootstocks at the top, which include Cleopatra, Sun Tzu Sha, US 897, and Sour Orange, have significantly less root reduction following this greenhouse inoculation test. Well, we use field testing to a large extent to evaluate Phytophthora and Diaprepes damage at present. This is uh, some testing that's undergoing uh, at the field site in Vero Beach. Uh, at this particular site, we know that uh, Swingle does extremely poorly uh, this, due to the combination of soil, Phytophthora, and Diaprepes. You can see in this uh, yellow square, that's a swingle tree two and a half years old with a grapefruit scion, obviously doing very poorly. In that same site, same age trees, grapefruit on US 802 and US 897, you can see the trees perform much better. This is part of the basis for saying these two particular rootstocks are rather tolerant of diprepes and phytophthora. 
while we've continued to use this particular site for other um, data collection, uh, evaluating performance of rootstocks in the site, and this is some cooperative work with Jim Graham and uh, Bob Adair. Uh, this table shows the performance of a number of new rootstock selections along with a few standards. Um, two different axes uh, showing mean root rating and, and the amount of Phytophthora present. Basically, when we look at this table, we can identify those in the upper right as being highly susceptible phy to Phytophthora. And if, I don't know if, how well you can see, but this includes Carrizo. The middle group, um, what I would call intermediate, with, inside the yellow oval, um, is more tolerant to uh, more, less susceptible uh, to Phytophthora. And that includes sour orange. The lower left group is what I would call the resistant group. And that's mainly what we're after in terms of finding rootstocks that are the most tolerant of Phytophthora. Uh, well, using uh, in part the Phytophthora evaluation and the Phytophthora dipreppies evaluation in the field, we now have a group of super, super sours that we're following up on. I'm not going to get into a lot of this yet, but basically I'm in the process of trying to arrange to put as many of the new super sour selections as possible uh, with commercial growers so we can start getting more widespread field performance information. You can see most of these hybrids are mandarin trifoliate, or pumelo trifoliate hybrids, pumelo mandarin hybrids, sorry. Um, some, in some cases, there, are some, there is some trifoliate in the parentage. Uh, there are some disease uh, resistance genes coming from trifoliate that we want to carry through. Um, and of course, uh, to come back to HLB disease, uh, rootstocks to provide tree tolerance uh, to greening disease. Uh, of course, you all know quite a bit about that pathogen now. That's what the conference is mainly focused on today. Uh, foliar symptoms on eutifoliate types like Volcomer and Cleopatra, you can see, again, visually very easy to, to look at. Uh, when we test rootstock selections in the greenhouse as ungrafted trees, we can see a very prominent effect. This is uh, Cleopatra mandarin. You can see that three trees on the left were not infected with greening disease. The three trees on the right were infected um, after they, they were cut, infected and then cut back. You can see that new flush is severely stunted and yellowed. Uh, this was 32 weeks after inoculation of the trees. Uh, interestingly enough, um, many of the, some of the trifoliate hybrid selections, like US 897 showed here, uh, the three trees on the left are not infected. The three trees on the right are infected with greening disease with HLB. They were inoculated and are in fact PCR positive, but they do not show any stunning or yellowing of the foliage at all following inoculation. So the rootstock itself is highly tolerant of the, the infection. And that can be illustrated here by the percentage of rootstock plants with foliar disease symptoms. You can see Cleopatra and Volcomer at 12 months after infection, that final column have between 80 and 90% of the trees showing clear foliar symptoms of HLB. In comparison, US 897 shows no symptoms, no foliar symptoms whatsoever. But it is important to note that this is talking about rootstock uh, seedlings, not the grafted tree. Unfortunately, um, or uh, first, rootstock seedlings like US 897 are very tolerant to HLB and show few, few symptoms in greenhouse testing. However, even when grafted on tolerant rootstock, sweet orange tree is still significantly weakened by HLB. And again, this is an HLB test, in uh, greenhouse tests. The best way to determine whether a rootstock will increase tolerance of a sweet orange tree in the field is with rootstock field trials. And I think that's why I come back to relying on field trials, field performance information, to make good judgments about what a rootstock is going to do. Um, as an example of that, I'll come back to a trial I mentioned earlier. This is a cooperative trial with David Wheeler in Polk County. In this trial, a uh, large proportion of the trees are infected with greening, some cl showing clear symptoms like the one on the right, others looking very healthy and appearing very productive like the one on the left. Um, Again, uh, one that looks great on the left, one that looks sick on the right, and relying on the performance in those trials that are infected by greening to decide which red stocks are going to do best. Again, US 942, 896, 802, and 812 performing relatively well compared to the standards. Um, Carrizo and Swingle and Kuharski, uh, somewhat less productive, and uh, the others coming out somewhere below. 
Development of rootstocks more resistant to HLB by transformation is another important part of my program. I guess, I'm, again, I'm not going to have much time to talk about that now. Basically, we're using genetic transformation to try to induce uh, genes for a high level of resistance to HLB. Uh, expressing foreign antimicrobial peptides is one part of the project. A more important part of the project is to in incre increase expression of natural cit citrus defense genes uh, because this gets, uh, takes away a lot of the concern about expressing foreign genes in citrus for commercial use. The citrus genes that we're focusing on the most are shown here. Again, I don't expect you to all to know that much about them, except the CT in front of each of the genes means it's a gene that is from citrus itself. So it's not a foreign gene. It's the citrus gene that we're just, a citrus uh, disease resistance gene that we're just increasing the expression. We have uh, thousands of these transformed plants in the greenhouse now that are in the process of being tested. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, one of the houses in which the uh, transformed plants are being inoculated with greening disease by psyllid inoculation, and then we're following the growth and development of those plants over time to evaluate uh, how the trees tolerate the disease. And again, I'm finishing up now. The whole point is to develop not just an ordinary tree, but a super tree that's going to give the supreme strength and health to the tree long term. And that's all I have planned to say. Uh, if there's a few minutes, I'd be happy to answer questions. Good.